Hey coach, welcome back to our channel. And in today's video, I'm going to be interviewing Coach Alvaro. Coach Alvaro is the founder and the owner of Score FC Soccer Academy based in Long Island in the United States. Alvaro has been coaching for many years. He is part of our Sports Accelerator program. A great coach, great person, a very insightful interview. Alvaro goes deep into uh, the boom of soccer in the United States. He talks a little bit about his journey in the game and where he wants to see his business in the next five years from now. So enjoy this interview. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with all the latest content that I'm putting out. And if you need more one-on-one -on -one help with your business, reach out to me, description below. You can contact me directly. Okay, enjoy the interview and I'll see you in the next one. So pretty much I was, I'm not sure how it, the story goes for everybody else. So obviously I grew up here. I was born in Peru. I came to the United States when I was about six. I started playing here, but I played in Peru when I was little. Uh, and I don't know if you call it playing, but you know, you just had the ball at your feet and you just went because right. you were playing in the streets <laughs> with the kids yeah. and this and that. It wasn't organized, but you know what? When you come from Hispanic, I guess mostly, you know, I know it happens all over else, but the first sport you learn is soccer. Yeah. So, anyway, so I came here and I played. Um, and then I had a very good career here, like they do in the United States. So you play club soccer, you play for your local high school, you know, and here in the United States is pretty much on where you're going to go next. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the statistics have shown that kids here who go play in high school, about 2.3% get to play in college. And that's between Division One, Two, Three, NAIA, JUCO, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's not. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you have like a hundred something thousand kids play soccer, that yeah. two percent is a pretty big number. Yeah. So you know, like I said, I played junior college for two years. Um, I was very fortunate enough to finish out as the number two team in the country in junior college, nice. and you know, my playing career there allowed me and. Yeah. I don't want to say gift to me, but I worked for it for, uh, to become an All-American. Like here in the United States, mm -hmm. being an All-American is like you're top of the class here. And, mm -hmm. you know, it allowed me to get a full ride to play at Fordham University, yeah, which is a Division One school here. And just like most kids here, you know, you, you grow up and you want to go D1 and because D1 is the top dog. Top you dog. Know, so, <laughs> top dog, you know, but – as, as you start to grow into your coaching, you start to learn, like, listen, if you have a chance to play college soccer, you're already a top dog above everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because not many kids get a chance to just play college soccer. Yeah. You know, so you got to consider yourself that. So during college or even before I entered college, when I was in high school, my father was a big time coach. My father coached me. And, you know, when I was younger and as I got older and – he got involved with a lot of coaching here on Long Island. He was uh, the first assistant coach for the Long Island Lady Riders here on Long Island. And he was their assistant coach for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the Lady Riders was a semi-pro team at the time. We didn't have the NWSL yeah. back then. You know, we had the what the Lady Riders was part of. That was the top league that they had here. You know, and him coaching there, you know, he started coaching what we call here on Long Island Long Island Select Team. So pretty much... Here you have you have a state team mm -hmm. and you have your select team and that's it, okay. you know. But it's not like that anymore. Now it's totally different. But back then that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So when he started coaching the select team and I was my junior year in college, he's like, "Listen, do you want to come help me coach?" Nice. I'm like, "All right, sure, why not?" You know, this and that. So obviously, coaching there um, propelled me to do what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, he we knew the club president for Long Island Junior Soccer, which is here is the governing body of Long Island soccer. Mm -hmm. And the president at the time, Peter Collins, was very good friends with my father. And he had, the Peter Collins had the idea of, you know, we should do like, you know, group or individual training sessions for kids who want it. Yeah. So he's like, do you want to ask your son for it? I'm like, sure, I'll do it. So we had these kids sign up 
for Saturday training sessions, I would drive to the soccer park here in Plainview. And, you know, we had about six, seven kids every week. Sometimes it'd be the same six, seven, different seven, six. So I'm like, and I started training them and this and that. And obviously I'm much more experienced now than I was back then. But, you know, I would just think of myself as, what, what do we need to do at this age group? And it was various age groups because we had, had a 12-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy and everything in between. Wow. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, all right, take things slow, you know, make sure they're doing everything right. And then that pretty much got me to, to coach. So I was doing, you know, many years with the Long Island Select team, about four or five, uh, about five, six years with them. And then when I graduated in 2003, I got my first assistant varsity coaching job at Fordham Prep. Mm -hmm. So Fordham University has a high school on it called Fordham Prep. I did that for a year. Then when I got out of college, um, I have a, a, a an alumni from Brentwood High School, which is the high school that I went to, who prior to much right now is ranked number one in the country in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, he decided, so listen, I need an assistant coach. I need a young guy at Chaminade High School. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, now I've heard of Chaminade High School, but I've never been there. And it's mm -hmm. a local Long Island school. So it's kind of weird. I don't know where it is. But the educational background on the school is one of the top schools in, in the country. Okay. So I became their assistant coach in 2004. And I stayed there up until this past year. So, and in that time, we've won numerous state, um, numerous league titles. Right now we are, we have nine state, the school has nine state titles in which I was part of eight of them. Nice. Um, you know, so right now I think I could be wrong, but we are the one, one of the winningest coaching pairs in New York. So um, I'm gonna, which is I'm, great. I'm gonna see you in the Premier League very soon then. Yeah, I only wish. Maybe <laughs> listen, I'll I'll be I'll be happy if I'm there as like the fourth, fifth assistant. You know, that'd be fine. I don't care. That'd be awesome. But um but pretty much coaching there. Um I was able to learn a lot from Mike, who was my head coach there mm -hmm. and um, very knowledgeable. And he pretty much helped me out along the way, still coaching with my father. And then we started what we call score FC. Mm -hmm. And it all started off as um, a gentleman that we knew was running two college, a uh, one college showcase tournament. And it was a big one. It was called score at the shore at the time. And every team from the country was coming to play this one in Long Island. So that kind of grew. Then it became two tournaments, one in New York, one in um, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then for six, seven years, it ran that way. Then it became New York. Then New York turned into North Carolina and Florida. And that's it. Boom, 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 boom. So we wow. would travel. We would have these tournament teams that me and my father were coaching at the same time. So was doing a lot of coaching and such like that and still with Chaminade and still this and that and, you know, that's pretty much my story on how I became a coach, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously being able to have great coaches near me, my father, Mike, you know, um, coach Ray Reed, who was a, you know, kind of like a big time college coach, you know, coach at UConn, Southern Connecticut, national titles here and there. You know, my Suffolk coach was a big time coach. His name is Chuck Shem. You know, I, I've been very blessed to have a lot of coaches who I've been able to learn from. And now everything I've learned, I was, I'm able to put into small group, individual, and team training is what we do now with Score FC. Okay, fantastic. So tell us a little bit about Score FC um, and also some challenges that you faced while while starting your business. Um, well, like I said, Score FC started off as a spinoff of what Score at the Shore was. Score at the Shore was a tournament team that would go to two tournaments a year, you know, we would take these kids and train with them once a week, okay. you know, go to these mm -hmm. tournaments. And that turned into, why are we only training once a week? Yeah. Let's just go three times a week and let's play in the league. Mm -hmm. So, and the way it all started was, was we started off with girls teams, only girls. We didn't do any boys. And that grew because the girls had younger brothers. Yeah. So now the girls aged out, the younger brothers were in, Amazing. And then it's kind of just like word of mouth. Oh, mm -hmm. who are you playing for? Who's training you? This and that. Oh, it's Coach Allen, Coach Ernesto, blah, blah, blah. So, and then that kind of grew. And then um, pretty much we started Score FC off of that. 
um, there was a need at the time for, you know, kids to get supplemental training. And obviously, and because there's nothing wrong with getting supplemental training, sometimes in a team setting, your head coach doesn't have the time available to address every individual player that he needs to do. Right, yeah. um, so, you know, supplemental training just came into fit, you know, um, luckily I bless my heart that I'm 44 and I get the fact that I don't look it so I can still move around and <laughs> still play. So if I'm and my biggest thing is as a, as a coach for myself, I have to be able to paint the picture of what I'm asking my players to do, or it's going to be tougher for me to explain what I need them to do. Yeah. So again, count my blessings that I'm still able to be able to move as a player. Mm -hmm. um, so we went from teams to pretty much our last team was about three or four years ago. But mm -hmm. throughout that time, I was still doing, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. We were doing group training, you know. Um, So-and-so heard, oh, listen, I need three or four of my kids. They're forwards. I need them to get training from you, please, because they can't score on the box. And like, boom, okay. Yeah. You know, my, my two midfielders, my two sixes, are they, they need help on how to be able to play behind the ball and just be able to scan a little bit quicker, you know, and, and see the field that are mm -hmm. like just going, you know, getting the ball and just dribbling through because, you know, as you get older, you start to know that the more the ball moves, the quicker the game goes. Mm -hmm. The more you hold the ball, it, the little dangerous it gets because you're going to hold the ball too long. You know, you, you there's other people who are making runs that are, are not going to get the ball. So we need them to make runs. So you got to be able to feed the ball. Yeah. So that's how pretty much all started. I mean, right now, difficulties here on Long Island is we have a lot of great clubs mm -hmm. that have now gotten better coaches in there within their clubs. So now it's kind of like all the kids that you were getting are now going to these clubs. And now it's kind of like, okay, now they kind of stay there a little bit and they don't find you anymore. Mm -hmm. But with the big soccer boom that we're having here, now everybody's trying to go back to, you know, I need my kid needs help in this. My kid needs help with this. Yeah. He, he can't strike a ball. He needs more technical work. Um, he needs more fitness work. He needs mm -hmm. both of them. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and your your name came up and word of mouth is probably the best thing I've had so far. Mm -hmm. Um, the most like, but to answer your question, the most difficult part is like there's so many of us here on Long Island. Yeah. Which is a good and a bad. Business-wise, mm -hmm. bad. Good, because that just means that we've produced a lot of great players. Mm -hmm. And have they become great coaches? That's a whole different issue. But if people are finding them and getting success, then they're doing something right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So t t tell us a little bit, what do you look for when you bring on a player into your program? Well, um, usually the youngest player I have is right now is eight years old. Mm -hmm. Um and it's usually sometimes like, and I'm not afraid to take on a kid who's just starting out um, because I love seeing the transformation of a kid starting out and now they're U8 and now they're U10. And now they're just like surpassing what you expected the first time you saw them. Mm -hmm. So that for me, that's a great story. Um, So I kind of look at, you know, the one is the family, you know, like does do the parents support the child because the child says, yeah, we want him to get training, but does the kid want it too? Because you don't want the kid to be forced there by mom and dad, because then you're not going to really get a hundred percent out of that training session because if the kids are feeling forced, they're not really into it. Yeah. You got to have a kid. You have to have the player, boy or girl that really want it that bad, like their eyes light up as soon as they see a soccer ball, like bang, like, oh, yeah. you know, you, you, you're you doing a simple move like a scissor or a step over a Maradona, and they're looking at you like, oh my God, that's so cool. I want to learn how to do it. But those are the type of kids, the kids are eager who are always wanting to learn more, you know, and I, and I guess when they're younger, all the flashiness is great. When they get older, now it becomes like the more technical part of, your game how can we make that better you know in terms of like do you open up well you know do you look over your shoulders at all times um can you see where you want the ball to go before you make your pass mm -hmm. you know so players that are older i'm looking to see like 
where are they in the development where you taught that before you came to me? Yeah. You know, because if not, then, okay, now I know what I need to work on. But when they're at a certain age level, you expect them to be taught that because mm -hmm. now you can expand on that as opposed to like going back to square one. Correct. But again, all depends on the stages of learning. Yeah. So, so we'll go back to what you said about the boom that's got was about to happen in the US. Um, yeah. We get coaches from all around the world that watch the channel and they're going to be watching this in, this this interview. So for those that aren't in the US, uh, talk to us a little bit about what's what's happening at the moment. Because the US in the next three to five years are getting very soccer greedy. Oh, Everything, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 everything's happening over there. So tell yeah. us a little bit, is that trickling down to to youth soccer? Are you seeing that there's there's a boom in the youth training? Well, I think there's been a boom mm. in youth training. Mm. Um, with the success of both the United States men's team and women's team, or even not reaching to their full potentials that they wanted to, but now it's kind of like, Players are because players are seeing it more, yeah, on TV and this and that, and obviously with everybody with the phone and the TV and this, they can catch a glimpse of everything all over the place. Yeah. So and again, just like you said, we're we're having, you know, the Copa America, oh, Copa America, the Concacaf, the World Cup, Women's World Cup, you know, the Olymp it it's it's crazy. Yeah. It's for us, it's it's a great thing because soccer is just everywhere all the time. Yeah. You know, if um. If it's ever there should be a boom, it should be now, mm -hmm. you know. But again, there's always been a boom. There's always been a want for soccer training. There's always here on Long Island. There's always been a want of where do I go to get the best training? Yeah, you know. And um, but like again, here on we have a lot of avenues. We have a lot of clubs who have training organizations who run them. We have one big soccer training organization that is a club that provides good training, you know, for all the kids and they have an, an, an enormous amount of kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but now that the soccer fever is coming, you know, New York city FC just got, um, approved for their stadium, you know, MLS expanded to two more teams. Then WSL, you know, has, has been had great success with their national team players who are, you know, getting drafted and this and that. And there's more money pumped into both organizations, MLS and the W. WM um NWSL. Um so I, I think the boom is great and I think it's it's good. Um I think the game will grow. There's more money put into like grassroots soccer, trying to find those kids who come from underprivileged areas, yeah. you know, to be able to shine in front of the kids who they couldn't shine in front of prior because, you know, a lot of kids can't afford to pay. Yeah. To play. You know, and for me, like I, I come from a neighborhood where there's a lot of kids who can't afford to play, but mm -hmm. there's kids who just love to play and you just see them. They're just raw mm -hmm. and they just have it. They're they're They have it in them. Just, you know, and I think the those opportunities for them to grow are great to have here, uh, which is why like the boom's going to boom is going to help them out. OK, so you live in, in an area where there's a lot of clubs that you, you just said. So if you so, like Long Island is very long. Yeah. So from here to here, there might be like 120 clubs. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. But, you know, so it's kind of like every town has a club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every town has a club. And most of the clubs have, like I said, private training organizations who run them. Or they within their club, they've been able to find mom and dad who coach. Some of them have experience with soccer. Some of them don't. But like right now, which how the governing body here in soccer is in order to coach, you have to have a coaching certificate, mm -hmm. coaching degree, you know, which is good because obviously, you know, as a coach, as if you're going to coach, you got to learn, you got to know what you're doing. Yeah. So forcing, forcing them or having them apply for these coaching courses and getting them are a great thing, you know, um, because now it gives them something to do. But a lot of times you'll find people who've played soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, or adults who played at a high level who are coaching their kids or within the club, which I think is, is great for for everybody. Yeah. So in in an if if a coach watching lives in an area very similar to you where it's overpopulated of, of clubs, what's a couple of ways that 
you can stand out so that parents choose you for their supplemental training? How can you stand out from clubs? You know, when when parents contact me, um, it's usually through, like I said, word of mouth. Right. You know, for me, I thank my parents all um, that I have. You know, I thank them because usually the parent tells me, oh, so-and-so, you know, recommended you. Mm-hmm. So I said, every time that happens, after I have a conversation with that parent, I go back and I say, thank you for recommending me to so-and-so. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, and just like kind of like everybody else, you know, we, we kind of jump on the social media boom wagon here. Mm-hmm. So it's Instagram, Facebook, you know, I, I put out whatever I can on there. So like even on April 22nd to 26th, I have a camp mm-hmm. in the facility that I work at, uh, in the physical therapy office that I work at here. We have turf room mm-hmm. and we have a camp. Wow. I'm having a camp for just 20 players only. Um, mm-hmm. from U12 to U15. I did a winter camp that was from like U10 to U15 and I had 30 kids. Amazing. So, but the 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 facility is a little tiny for 30 kids. Yeah. You know, so that's why I only did it for 20 um mm-hmm. this time and I'm and I'm thinking I have right now I have half of it full. You know, yeah. we still got another 2 weeks left or so. Um, so I'm trying to get it full for the next 10. Um but, you know, putting whatever I can out for social media, you know, mm-hmm. video clips, offers here and there. Um, my my reach is whoever has seen me before, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I also tell my parents and all the kids that I have, you know, like and follow, obviously, and share all my stuff. Because you never know if your friend, your neighbor, your teammate needs extra help, mm-hmm. wants to come train with you, you know, and... Pretty much then I just get text messages and emails say, listen, what's your training uh, sessions are like? Are they monthly, weekly, you know, this, this and that. So I try to pretty much try to walk them through it. And then the steps that I've learned from Coach Ben and yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, So this way, it's been very, very fortunate enough for me to be able to still stick with the clients that I have and gain a couple of new ones. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So where, where do you see score FC in the next five years? You know, I had a conversation with this the other day about somebody and, and um, I, I would love for it to, to grow and be big in terms of like being able to have 50, 60 clients under my belt. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that a great goal. I find that something that I want to attain couple of factors that throw in is like like i said i'm 44 so i have two kids mm-hmm. so time is of the essence because you when you're when you're grown you know you don't plan ahead too much about like spending time with the family and this and that once you have a family now it's starting to be like you know you now you want to spend more time with your family yeah um and like i said i spoke to somebody about this before and my my advice was to anybody who's young if you take myself at 22 when i started this my goal was like you know what i want to get 100 clients and i can do it between the ages of 20 and 30 yeah. and then call a day because now i'm like i have it's, it's just me i have time and i don't have a family responsibility in terms of I have my own kids because i don't want to lose that time that time is precious <clears throat> so get your certifications in and Learn how to do the business the right way so you don't get into any trouble whatsoever later on. You're covered on all bases. You know what you're doing for almost anything that can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, at least you're prepared. Um, but again, 44 takes me five years to 49, close to 50. Like again, if I can get to 60 clients and I'm still helping grow kids into being better players so they have an opportunity to play in college, yeah. great. Um, you know, that's pretty much my overall goal every time I have a client is pretty much what's the outlook for you. If I have a 12-year-old, okay, outlook's going to be can we get you to the next three years to get you to 15 and be able to try out for your varsity team mm-hmm. at 15? You know, here, you know, you can try it at varsity in ninth grade. Um, very rare does a ninth grader make a varsity team yeah. depending on the school district here um i myself again fortunate enough to be able to be one of those players in brentwood to do that um 
but because I know what it takes to get there. So it's not just like you can be good, but you have to be better than the people who are 10, 11, and 12th graders to be able to do that. You can be good at 15, but can you give them a reason why you should be on there on the varsity level? Um, so that would, that, that's my overall goal. Whoever I have five years from now, where do I get you in five years? Hmm. You know, can I get you to that next level? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Alvaro, well, thank you very much for coming on, uh, sharing your, your, your journey with us. Uh, if any coach wants to connect with you, they might be in Long Island or just around the world. They like your story. They want to contact you. What's the best place for them to contact you or follow you, what you're doing? I mean, you can contact me on Instagram at score FC soccer um, is one. You can contact me through email at score FC soccer at gmail.com. Perfect. So those are the two best ways to contact me. And again, I'm, I'm open. I'm willing to help anybody out whatsoever. You know, it's always good to have connections across the pond. So it'll be nice. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll, we'll add that to the bottom of the video. So any coach that wants to reach out or follow your stuff uh, can do so. Okay. So, well, thank you for taking the time out to, to come on. Um, and my goal is in a year's time, bring you back on the podcast and see where, where you're currently at with your, with your training business. Perfect. Look forward to it. All right. Take care.